hello hello welcome back to my channel it's emma and i'm here with my wrap up of february we're gonna be wrapping up february that's a wrap well it's gonna be a wrap but i'm not gonna wrap okay anyway well, first things first watch me thank the sponsor of today's video nord green watches did you see what i did there i'm not gonna take up too much of your time but i would really like to thank nordgreen for giving me a beautiful beautiful watch they are a danish company that specializes in making simple and minimalistic watches while also being very concerned on being sustainable all the way from each step of the production to the delivery to the door of their customers i really appreciated that nordgreen on their website and pretty much everywhere on all their social media are very upfront about the specific ways and how they are sustainable and environmentally friendly um, and not just saying it they actually list out the steps so all of the packaging that they use to ship you the watch is made from upcycled plastic bottles and fsc approved cartons additionally they do plant thousands of trees to offset any carbon emissions that they might produce from their office in copenhagen on top of that and i think this one is the coolest they actually have a giving back program in which they've selected three different ngos that they donate to every time you make a purchase you can actually go on their website register the serial number of your watch and purchase and then you as the customer get to choose which of those three NGOs you would like to make a donation to. In 2020, Nordgreen donated 33,000 months of education, 64,000 months of clean water, and they protected 900,000 square meters of the rainforest. I do have a discount code for you guys if you are at all interested in getting a new watch anytime soon, and I will leave it here, and it is Emmy for 15% off their website. The watch that I chose is the one called The Philosopher. I got the watch face in gold, and then for the strap, I chose the brown vegan leather. Um, this one is sized at 36 millimeters. I've been wearing it every day and I really, really like how it feels. It's extremely lightweight. The vegan leather is super soft and I really love the coloring of this combination as well. After registering um, my watch on their website, I chose to make my donation to the NGO called Cool Earth, which is an organization that is trying to protect as much rainforest as possible in Latin America. And I just think that's like such a good cause and I know the rainforest is such an important part um, of our planet. On top of that, I really have enjoyed working with Nordgreen. They have been so lovely. I love their product and I just think it's so cool how they're basically one of the only companies I've seen to actively like include and get customer and consumer participation in their giving back program and in their sustainability um, projects and visions. Yeah, I just thought that was so cool. I wish more companies did that. So yes, thank you so much Nordgreen for working with me. And like I said, there is the discount as well as links will be in the description box for their website if you guys would like to check them out so without further ado let's get into all of the books that i read in february so let's talk about them all right so the first book that i read in february was a little lump in novelita by roberto bolaño um this is my first time reading bolaño and i really really enjoyed it i had no idea what to expect from this one uh once again i'm going to be telling you kind of where i found these books and a new word if i did learn a new word. So this one was recommended to me on Audible and I just stepped in because it sounded really interesting. So in a little lumpen novelita, actually let's begin a different place. Let's begin with the title because I had absolutely no idea what lumpen meant. I think in the context of this title it means vaguely dispossessed and isolated from normal and average societal and economic and kind of these classist ideas. So you're just dispossessed of like these things that humanity has categorized into different people and different classes and stuff like that which does make sense because in this novel we are following a girl Bianca and her unnamed brother the two of them live in Italy with their parents but this book opens with both of their parents dying in the same car crash so they are immediately just thrown into oceans upon oceans of grief and confusion and rage and not knowing what to do. The two of them stay living in their apartment together. They don't really know what to do. Bianca's working at a hair salon and her brother is working at a local gym um, as basically a glorified janitor. So they're both trying to kind of make ends meet. They're both extremely young and they're just basically cast off from society as these grief-stricken people. So much of this novel is so suffocating because we're mostly following Bianca she basically kind of never well she never leaves like figuratively the realm of her parents house she's always stuck in this one place always brought back to this one place and moment of grief and losingness um, having lost something completely important so even though she can step outside 
she can go to her job at the hair salon she is just so much trapped in this house and in this apartment it's a very suffocating novel um it's also a very sad novel it definitely put me in a funk this um novelita i guess not really a novel <laughs> begins with bianca telling us that she is now grown up she's now a mother but before all of this she used to lead a life of crime and then after that sentence the book opens with her parents dying in a car crash so her brother starts to bring home these people that he meets at the local gym and they might not be um, really in line with the law. They might be doing some stuff to make ends meet and to make money outside of the law and eventually they pull Bianca into their schemes. And from there we just follow kind of the slowly, vaguely like sludge-like world that Bianca descends into of grief and madness and confusion and growing up at the same time and trying to make money at the same time and eventually getting involved in crime. This was an extremely subtle book. Um, a lot of times I had no idea what was really being said and it's a book that you really have to think about there were a lot of dream sequences the writing was very blunt very to the point a lot of the time which was nice but somehow even that bluntness um afforded a great amount of subtlety and a great amount of confusion in certain scenes and the way that Bolaño would describe what's going on and stuff like that so it was really really interesting though and the more and more i think about it i'm just like oh no, wait, because like things aren't really explicitly said, but I think you as a reader, you're very much drawn into believing in certain things that could be connected in this book and the real reason why things happen and who people really are in this book. Like he completely just leaves it to you, which is really cool. But mostly this book is kind of a meditation on crime, what is considered a crime, who can commit crime, the way that um, these outside forces can all of a sudden just break and crash into your life and completely change you and alter you as a person and they're always there. Those forces are always going to be on the outskirts and on the fringe of your life even if you don't think about them, if you push them to the back of your mind, if you don't think about the possibility that your loved ones could die at any second, if you don't think about the possibility that you could die at any second, those forces and those events are still potentially always there and this book just shows what happens to someone like Bianca when those forces do crash in um, and how ultimately she becomes part of that lump in uh, lump <laughs> that minority that people don't really see until it happens to you it's just a really cool little kind of scene little vignette about those forces that can just push into your life and completely change who you are change your whole view on the world and make you into someone else um, and give you a life that you never thought you would have to lead. I think on the whole I gave this about 3.75 stars because I did enjoy it but like I said I didn't really have any expectations. I don't know if this was the best place to start with Bolaño but very very interested, don't get me wrong, so interested in reading more of his work. So that is a little lump in novelita. The next book I read in February was Aurora Rising. <laughs> it's always so hard for me to say Aurora Rising. Aurora Rising by Jay Kristoff and Amy Kaufman. This is, I believe, their newest series. I think they're still working on it. Young adult sci-fi. I really enjoyed it, honestly. I gave it four stars. Mostly this was just kind of mind-numbing entertainment with a lot of jokes thrown in. Um, I have to say, if you have read their Illuminae Files series, or if you haven't read the Illuminae Files series, I would 100% recommend that series to you so much more than Aurora rising. If you are interested in this one, we basically follow another band of teenagers who are in outer space. It's set far in the future and humanity has discovered how to travel extremely long distances in the blink of an eye via this phenomenon that we've discovered called the fold in which the universe is like a piece of paper that you can fold and by going from one corner to another you can travel. Anyway, not super important. Actually, it is pretty important. <laughs> so we are set at Aurora Academy. It's basically like its own space station that trains young cadets to kind of enter the universe and protect the universe because as you can imagine there are a lot of civil wars in the future. There's a lot of new aliens we've discovered. So on the night before graduation the kind of golden boy of this academy is restless. He can't sleep even though he's at the top of his class and he's basically assured to get the best squad once they all graduate and go off on their first mission. So he's restless and takes a late night space flight through space, as you do. Unfortunately, while he's here, he runs into an extremely old starship. 
that people had presumed had gone missing. This was a starship like sent off from Earth to colonize a far off planet, but it never made it and everyone assumed that everyone on board just died. However, he finds this floating starship and he sees that there's one person still alive on it and that turns out to be Aurora. She is from Earth and she has been asleep for like 200 years or something. She's really getting her beauty sleep. So Tyler saves Aurora's life and it turns out that he misses graduation and is therefore left with the last picks, if you will, of kind of the space cadets of Aurora Station. So he is left with a whole bunch of people who basically don't want to work together, they've got various problems of their own, they're very misunderstood, and they are sent on their first mission in space. So you basically just follow them going through a whole bunch of problems, trying to get along with each other, finding out who everyone is, um, and then they got involved in various heists and plots and adventures and misadventures, and you can guess the rest. I don't think this book was great, but like I said, it was just nice entertainment value. I really did like listening to it. It was definitely a book that flew by super fast, pardon the pun, and I just really liked it, honestly. I liked a lot of the characters in here, and I think this is a series that I am definitely very interested in continuing on with. Jay Kristoff and Amy Kaufman, that duo, they just have a very um, engaging and funny writing style, and I think that's really what keeps this book alive, because it's definitely a plot that I've seen done a hundred times, and to be fair, I think a lot of it is just like copy-paste from leftover ideas that they maybe didn't get to do in the Illuminae files, because this does follow another big group of teenagers, but that was fine, honestly. So I gave it four stars and I'm definitely looking forward to uh, continuing on with this one. I first heard of Aurora Rising from Ashley over at A Frolic Through Fiction and then I decided to start with the Illuminae Files, but now we're here. We've come full circle because it's been like over exactly a year now, I think, since I started Illuminae. So we have The Year of the Hair by Arto Pasolina, which I really, 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 really liked. I gave this four stars. This is a classic piece, I believe, of Finnish literature. It came out in, I think, 1975 or something like that. And it is just like, basically the plot and all the happenings of the story is just something that like I deeply need. <laughs> it's a need, I need this in my life. Um, this was incredibly interesting. I think this is another book that I enjoy more the experience of having read rather than the experience of reading or listening. Um, I think this was really, really fun and it presented itself as kind of a very fun, strange, quirky, silly little book, but deep down it really explores some important issues of um, our relationship with nature and our relationship with ourselves and how we've built up um, the modern human, the way that we work, the way that we play, our family relationships, our dynamics, and um, how we live basically because the year of the hair is about this reporter named Vatanen and he is on a job, he's driving through the Finnish countryside when his van accidentally hits a hare. He breaks the rabbit's leg and it basically goes like flying off into the bush. He is, I think his whole life probably before this van ride, I think we know exactly how it goes because instead of just continuing on down the road or maybe just making sure that the rabbit's okay, he just fully gets out of his van, scoops the hair up and runs into the forest and no one ever sees him again. People do see him again, but like, that's not what I mean. There's just some man running around Finland with a rabbit in his arms, that's great. No, but basically for him hitting this hair, is his wake-up call. He's been deeply unhappy with the way that he's living, with the way that society is living, in his marriage, um, with his job as a reporter. He finds very little satisfaction or like deep soul-quenching uh, purpose in his life and in his work. So when he hits this hair, he just sees it as an opportunity, grabs it, and he rushes out into the brush. The call of the wild has called him and he's picked up, but he's also thrown away his phone at the same time. From there, I would describe this book as the Odyssey, but it's just a dude and his rabbit jumping around Finland, basically. The nature of this book is extremely hoppy, hence like the hair image. This book just jump cuts. It's very strange. We just bound from one location to another. We follow Vatanen as he goes from city to city. He encounters these strange and bizarre circumstances and people. Um, in one of them, his wife and like his boss are chasing him through town. In another, he is arrested for trying to stay at this guy's house. This is a book that I would just love to like 
plot like on a graph somehow because he goes from like this very urbanized very modern existence to essentially breaking down every single barrier that we've ever constructed between ourselves and nature um and just really going back there and reconnecting with what it means to be a human i think in the most like primitive sense and it was just so splendid it just it made me feel things and it was so wonderfully funny at that because the way that pasolina like presents to you the reader these circumstances and these people and these strange like societal norms he presents them as absolutely bizarre and weird and like in that just makes you see how bizarre these rules we've really created for ourselves are and how stupid some of them are and just it just makes you want to go grab a rabbit and run somewhere with this rabbit. <laughs> also the relationship between Vatanen and this hare was just so nice. It was like there was this like ribbon between him and the rabbit. It became like his companion animal. They eventually learned to like talk to one another in their own language and it was just really really beautiful like seeing yourself in an animal and then like having that companionship and that friendship and that connection with nature as you jump all over the country. I saw someone describe this book as a series of accidents and I would 100% say um, that's what this book is but I think like life is just a series of accidents and as many mishaps that are in this book Vatanen always finds himself like exactly where he needs to be at a specific time like he's always where he needs to be um, and he always finds purpose in where he is, no matter what's happening. And it just completely dispels like every myth of like this very linear path of life that the modern world has created for us. And it was just so wonderful. I highly recommend it. It also had a very magical fairy tale, fable, fantasy vibe to it, which I absolutely adored. And I just think it was really, really great. So that is the year of the hair. The word I learned from the year of the hair is curlew, curlew, but this means various largely brown and chiefly migratory birds that have long legs and a down curved bill and they are related to sandpipers. I had no idea what kind of bird this is, but I'll insert a picture of it here. Um, and this word comes from the Anglo-French word curlew, and that is of imitative origin, which is really cool. So I imagine like the call of this bird sounds vaguely like that. Right. play that I don't really have too much to say about is Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. This was the Dark Academics pick for February. I love this. I gave it 4.5. I think this is maybe my new favorite Shakespeare play. I had a super good time reading this. Um, I got chills. I got so invested. I think just having studied like um, the Roman Republic and Rome and the classical studies for a number of years at uni, it just gave me like a very deep um, connection, I think, because I think there is a little bit of connection that could be missing from just Shakespeare's version of this, but like going in and just like knowing these people and then seeing Shakespeare come to know them and come to give them a voice and of course a very beautiful, lyrical, just incredible voice was just wonderful. Julius Caesar, as you can imagine, follows Caesar's um, fall, his assassination and basically what happens Afterward, the fight for control, what happens to the two main conspirators, Brutus and Cassius, and it was just really, really wonderful. I have to say I enjoyed the first half of this so much more than the second half. Um, I don't really, really love like fight battle scenes, fight scenes, wars in Shakespeare because I find it honestly a little bit tedious and boring. I much prefer like the very kind of close up um, intimate conversations, and especially in this one, the relationship between Brutus and Cassius was just out of this world, top tier. I just absolutely love every single line that came out of every single person's mouth. It was just incredibly beautiful. Um, the word that I learned from Julius Caesar, it's very interesting. I've never heard of it before. And that is Alderleifest, which means most beloved. So I thought that was really cool. But yeah, I'm just really glad that I got to read another Shakespeare. Um, my first Shakespeare of the year. I think it's my first play of the year, is it? Um, and I just really, really enjoyed this. So I would highly recommend, um, very much looking forward to reading more as always, but really love this one. Then I read a couple books that I wasn't too crazy about. The first one is NP by Banana Yoshimoto. I gave this three stars. This one was set up to make me think that I was really gonna love it. And then just the way that this book went, I didn't end up really loving it. So NP kind of like 
the framework of this book, what it's about. We have a Japanese author who's lived in the United States for a while and he writes uh, stories in English. This book is set in Japan and we follow different people who are trying to translate um, the works of this Japanese author from English into Japanese. However, there's this very kind of mysterious and scary thing that happens and goes on with these translators when they try to specifically translate the 98th short story in one of his collections. Uh, and for some reason, this 98th short story ends up resulting in the suicides, multiple suicides of translators who are trying to convert this work into Japanese. Our protagonist is a young girl who was recently in a relationship with one of these translators who is now committed suicide and we follow her as she reconnects with this Japanese author's son and daughter, learns kind of their tragic backstory, what their life was like growing up in America, what their father was like who was writing these short stories, and they kind of try to delve deeply into what is really going on here, what is happening, what is the nature of language, why is this occurring. So I thought kind of that's what this book was going to be about, which I'm super interested in, kind of that like futileness of language and the inability to really get anything across in any one language and then kind of that double layer of inability of trying to get things across in a meaningless language to like another meaningless language um which was super interesting for example our protagonist had a super interesting experience where she stopped talking for a very long time and then came to experience life and the world and emotion and communication just simply through color, different colors. So I thought that was incredibly interesting, but mostly what this book focused on was like weird things. <laughs> um, it kind of focused on these strange and abusive relationships between different people. There was a lot of incest. It just went a completely opposite direction from what I really wanted. This was my first uh, Banana Yoshimoto book, so I don't know if this was the best place to start either, but this one was recommended to me also on Audible, so I decided to give it a go, and there definitely were some aspects of this book I adored, but on the whole, just wasn't super captivated, wasn't super into it, so that is NP. The word I learned from this one is arbiter, which is a person with power to decide disputes. And that comes from the Middle English arbiter with a U. <laughs> um, and then that comes from the Latin word arbiter itself, which means an eyewitness or an onlooker or something of the sort like that, a bystander witnessing something. My least favorite book of the month was unfortunately The Year of the Witching by Alexis Henderson. This one I found on Libby and I put it on hold ages ago because it was a fairly new release, I think. July 2020 or something like that, but this one sounded so creepy, kind of very horror, scary, witchcraft, occult, supernatural subjects and themes. Unfortunately, um, it just didn't work for me for a number of reasons. So a very vague synopsis, The Year of the Witching follows a girl named Emmanuel, and we are set in the fictitious little town of Bethel, which is extremely religious, a very puritanical society in which it's ruled over by this man called the Prophet. He has a whole bunch of wives and basically the whole town is just set um, in the middle. And then the outside is this forest called the Dark Wood in which there's said to be witches, um, different witches and spirits and demons and just bad things. You don't go, you don't go in the Dark Wood, don't do it. Emmanuel's mother was one of the prophet's wives, but then she had an affair from someone from the outskirts outside of Bethel, and that's basically a sin. You're not allowed to do that, so Emmanuel's whole existence is basically just blasphemy. No one approves of her, no one thinks very much of her, and so her existence in Bethel is very much a struggle. As you can imagine, as this book goes on, Emmanuel does venture into the dark woods and begins to find out things about herself, about what's really going on in this town and in the woods, and what the nature of these witches might be, and it just sounded like it was gonna be so good, but the writing style was completely bland. I think one of the most boring, just kind of monotone tone and like voice I've ever gotten from a book before. It was just, everything was made extremely bland, not interesting, nothing grabbed my attention, nothing made me care about anything. I felt like any elements of the occult or the supernatural or witchcraft or any of these religious puritanical um, subject matters and like the whole plot of this book, they just felt extremely wasted to me. I think I was saying in one of my vlogs, but everything felt extremely surface level. It felt like as a reader, there were almost no opportunities to dive deeper into this book. It felt much too simple in its kind of moral and message to the readers. It felt like 
there was no place else for me to go. Nothing was left to my imagination, no symbol, no metaphor, no deeper meaning. It just felt like the author was the one doing absolutely all of the work to give you everything, to tell you the meaning of everything. Like it felt like there was no play with these images and with these different ideas that she was discussing and using, which could have been so cool in a book like this, I think. The whole thing with the witches in the woods, what I like was very much looking forward to, just fell so flat for me. And Emmanuel as a character, I just, I really didn't know who she was. I didn't know who anyone was in this book really. Like I said, just not a fan of the writing. This book did not go the direction that I thought it was going to go. I marketed it as a dark feminist fantasy, but by the end of it, I was just kind of like, okay. Like, I'm not really sure really what was accomplished here. I also thought this was a standalone, but I think since it's been decided that this is going to be a series, nothing really captivated me. Nothing made me want to keep reading. I almost DNF'd it a couple times and just on the whole, I was really disappointed, which is a shame because I really wanted to love this. But regardless, that is the year of the witching. The word that I learned is pernicious, which means highly injurious or destructive, which comes from the Middle English, coming from the Anglo-French, which comes from the Latin pernices which means destruction. So that is cool. I also listened to Let Us Compare Mythologies, which is a collection of Leonard Cohen's poems. Very hard to say. These were written when he was very young, I think between the ages of 15 and 22. And as you can imagine, there were definitely a few, honestly, that I really enjoyed in this collection, mostly towards the beginning. Near the end, honestly, a lot of these poems kind of slid into like the very sexist, uncomfortable, um, saying questionable things about women realm for me, which was kind of disappointing, but also what I was expecting a little bit, but the poems that were focused on nature and like mythology and religious imagery, I thought a lot of those were very nice, especially to listen to, and I did enjoy those. I just wish that kind of maybe would have continued and would have been explored a bit more rather than just focusing on like what what the later poems focused on but i'm really glad that i listened to this and i think i would like to read more in the future but i'm not really sure where to go from here so yeah that is let us compare mythologies the second last book that i read in february um this was my favorite book of the month i just oh my gosh i don't even know what i'm gonna be about to say about it i have so many thoughts and this is a book i definitely want to reread that is snow by orhan pamuk this was in bah, indescribable this was so good so pamuk is a very famous turkish author and this was just incredible there's so much going on in this book that i cannot even begin to describe to you right now but the premise of this book, our narrator in this book is Orhan Pamuk. Like he is very much a character in this book, which I really, really liked. Um, I think it worked perfectly. I love the tone of this book. I love how it like broke every wall. I just adored this. So Orhan Pamuk is narrating the life of his friend Ka. Ka has been in exile in Germany for the last 12 years. Um, he grew up in a very well-off kind of middle-class family and he thinks of himself very much as kind of a westernized man. But he decides to come back to Turkey for his mother's funeral and while he's there, he decides to take a trip to the border city of Kars. I also recently learned that um, Kar means snow. So that's cool as well. He goes back to Kars under like the guise of being a reporter because at the minute in Kars, there is so much religion religious and political turmoil. There's a huge wave of suicides going through the city. Um, a number of young girls are forbidden to wear their headscarves. They are barred from their classrooms, from education, from going to school, um, and so they have committed suicide. So Ka goes to cars um, under the guise of reporting on these incidents, but He's not a reporter at all, he is a poet, and he's actually going back to Cars to reconnect with an old classmate named Epac because he kind of wants to marry her. The only real problem I had with this book was that I could just not stand our protagonist, Ka. I really, really could not do it. He was an incredibly frustrating protagonist to follow. So this book is called Snow, and I think if you do read it, you need to be prepared that this book is 100% so much snow. This is the book with the most snow like I've ever seen mentioned or put down or discussed, and I just really loved it because it worked so, so well. There were so many mentions of how much snow is falling while Ka is in cars, the city gets snowed in, all of the roads are blocked off, and so we have this very isolated city 
basically like at the end of the world as Ka keeps saying. So much of this book is the people in cars and so much of um, what Ka is saying as well is that the city of Kars has just been completely forgotten not only by the Western world but also by Turkey itself and especially just ridiculed by Istanbul and everything like that so well we are all snowed in in Kars there is so much that goes on there is a terrorist who comes and is staying in the city and people are trying to find out what's going on with him there is an election coming up and there are different opposing parties some very religious some very secular there is a revolution there is a coup that is literally staged so much of this book is about kind of the farce of politics um, the theater of politics the art of politics and it was just so interesting what Pamuk discussed in here. I think it was so brilliant. And then to do all of that with the imagery of snow. There are so many discussions of God and religion and politics and art. Um, and especially because Ka is a poet, he's actually been unable to write while he's been in exile in Germany. But the minute he comes back to Kars, he begins receiving these poems that are just given to him and he can just immediately put down to paper. Um, describing everything that's going on. It's an extremely tragic book. Uh, it was a hard book to read as well, and it was just so wonderfully done. I absolutely cannot praise this enough. This book taught me so much uh, history that I didn't know, so much politics I didn't know, so much about religion that I didn't know, and on top of that it was just so wonderfully written, so many wonderful quotes, and it just, I don't know, it really worked for me. It hit all my boxes and I just really adored it. I can literally, I just cannot wait to read more Pamuk. I don't know where to go from here, but like anywhere. I'm just willing to go anywhere with him. It's just, it was incredible. At times I definitely found this book very challenging, very um, thought provoking, and it's definitely one that I'm going to think about for forever. This, I might bump this up to a five star, honestly, um, depending on how much I think about it and how much it stays on my mind during the next short while, because usually that's always how I can tell. So I think I might go back and change my rating in a few days. Um, depending on what, but it's just, oh my gosh, it's so good. This book also like invited me into so much consideration of the image and the symbol of the snowflake and not just like snow as a plural thing, like just the one snowflake because so much of this book is about hidden symmetry and like the symmetry of life and patterns in life and fate versus um, choosing your own destiny and stuff like that as well. There's just so much wrapped up in this book and it was just incredible, just incredible. So that is Snow. And finally, the last book that I read in February also adored this so much, that is Deadly Dreams by KJ Sutton. This is the third book in the Fortuna Sworn series. I love this, I love this so much. Oh my gosh, I, ah, I just have come to really, really love this series. Like I read Fortuna Sworn, the first one, and wasn't completely into it, wasn't super, down with the series but by the time i got to the second one i just felt like head over heels for all the, every character everyone in here the plots i have just become so invested in the series and then when i finished this one i was like dang it now i have to wait until like december when i think the next one comes out i'm not going to say too much about the plot of this one since this is the third installment but the general premise is that we're following fortuna sworn who is a nightmare in that she can make you feel your worst fear um and you can potentially even perish due to this like intense fear when she makes contact with your skin. She is also potentially the last of her kind because in the first book her brother Damon has been missing for two years so when a fairy shows up saying that he will take her to her brother if she agrees to marry him, she does. What I've been able to put my finger on and what I love so much about this series is that KJ Sutton's writing, her style of writing, her dialogue, her tone, her sarcasm, her jokes, just everything is so perfectly married to the genre. Like, I don't think I've ever seen someone's style of writing so perfectly aligned with the genre. For me, it was just like perfect genre writing in which someone's style just so perfectly gets that genre right. And it was just, it's an extremely satisfying read. I also really, really appreciate that KJ Sutton is an author who deals with trauma and discusses trauma and really takes a lot of time discussing these things that happen to us and these very upsetting and traumatic experiences because so much of what I dislike in fantasy and young adults and sci-fi is that these huge traumatic things happen to our characters either for shock value and a lot of the time you can tell they're just for shock value because they're never discussed again 
we never see the consequences we never see our characters suffering with these things we never hear them speak about them it's just like it happens and then it doesn't matter anymore but in the fortuna sworn series everything is dealt with so beautifully and it's not dealt with immediately sometimes it's taken books um for these things to carry themselves through and stuff that happened in the first book is continually brought back and mentioned all the way uh where we are now and it's just so rewarding and so real and so refreshing to see this book definitely has a lot of trigger warnings and in that though i just feel like everything is so well done like this book gave me things that i didn't even know i needed um and on top of that you just really feel like you're like fighting for these characters and like rooting for them and i just love it it's so entertaining i love the split of like this fantasy romance series i feel like those two parts that make up this genre are so wonderfully balanced out um and i'm just i don't know how it happened but i am just 100 percent in love with the series now and um yeah that's that I'd also really recommend the audiobooks because not only is KJ Sutton's writing just so perfect for this um, book, I mean like it's her book, but you know what I mean, the audiobook narrator's voice is also just like in my opinion so perfect. I can't imagine anyone else doing it now. Um, so I just love it. I would highly recommend the audiobooks as well. I first heard of the Fortuna Sworn series because Becca over from Becca and the Books um, mentioned it. I've gone through and listened to like all of her vlogs about them and it just really inspired me to pick it up. and. I loved it so definitely going to be following more for fantasy romance recommendations in the future too all right so that is now everything i read in february i think we've been here for a long time and i now have a watch to tell me exactly how long i've been sitting here um it's actually very embarrassing but like i've had to kind of relearn how to tell time <laughs> um now that i've got like a proper watch because i've been using digital for like my whole life honestly um so yeah it's been a bit of a learning curve honestly as much as that's embarrassing to admit, but it's just because I've been so out of practice, I never use analog clocks. This is definitely like giving me an excuse to, to practice telling time. It only took a couple of days and now I'm like pretty, pretty good at telling time guys. Thank you. Seriously, once again, thank you to Nord Green for sponsoring this video. The links are in the description and I hope you enjoyed chatting about everything I read in February. Um, what was your favorite read of the month? Yeah, I would love to know. All right, without further ado, I've talked so much that the sun is now going down. So I will see you in my next video. Thank you so much for being here. And yeah, I hope you're doing so well. Ciao.